a little more success than last night. Uh, before we start out tonight, I'd like to make an announcement about the Ag Travel Course to China, which is going in the first summer session in 1980, summer of 1980, of course, and an informational meeting is going to be held from 5 to 6 p.m. December 19th in room 124 Kildee. I'll repeat that so you get it. The informational meeting is being held from 5 to 6 p.m. December 19th in 124 Kildee. Okay. And is there anyone here that if anybody has any questions about it right now, they might ask. I think Dr. Brackles, Bracklesburg is here. I believe he's going to go. So if you can hunt him up. He's right over here. If you have any questions, maybe after the meeting, you might be able to catch him if that's all right. Okay. All right. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's Institute on World Affairs lecture. And before I introduce this evening's speaker, I'd like to make uh, the announcements about tomorrow's events that are going to be held in conjunction with the Institute. At noon, we have the film Mission to Yunnan. And this is at uh, 12 noon, of course, in the Pioneer Room of the Memorial Union. At 3 p.m. tomorrow, and also in the Pioneer Room, Susan Warren will speak about China and Vietnam. And tomorrow evening's lecture is Chinese Foreign Policy, and this will be by Ed Friedman. And this is in this same room at 8 p.m. the center. Okay. And if you have any questions or if you didn't pick one up, the brochures are available in the back of the room. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Benedict Stavis. Dr. Stavis is an assistant professor of agricultural economics at Michigan State University. He's the author of Politics of Agricultural Mechanization in China, along with numerous other works on agricultural development in China. Dr. Stavis received his bachelor's degree from Haverford College and his master's and doctorate degrees from Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Benedict Stavis. I'd like to thank you for the introduction, and I'd particularly like to thank the Institute on World Affairs for inviting me out here. It's, uh, with the exception of myself, I should say, a most remarkable program for the week. And I, I think you're extremely fortunate to have the opportunities to hear so many of these outstanding speakers. And I hope that you'll all have as, you know, take advantage of this opportunity. I would particularly point out the movie on Thursday at noon on people's communes. I assume that's the Felix Green film? the Thursday film, People's Commune. I think that that film will outline some of the institutional questions, the structural questions, kind of the, the base material, which I'll be um, analyzing tonight. I won't really give much in the way of concrete description of how the rural areas are organized. So I hope that uh, to make up for that deficiency, you can go see that movie on Thursday at noon. It would have been much simpler for me to give a talk on rural development in China had uh, I been invited here two years ago, because then I was much more certain about what was happening in China. Uh, if two years ago I would have given a very simple lecture about how China was so successful in its rural development. I would have emphasized that China had achieved agricultural growth through technical transformation, through the massive supply of inputs. I would have pointed out that China's fertilizer industry is the third largest in the world, that China developed dwarf varieties of rice before the International Rice Research Institute. I would emphasize simple statistics like China produces 40 per, compared with India, China produces 40% more food per capita uh, for 50% uh, more people on 20% less land. And I would have argued that China had retained equity, had, had massive redistribution, was achieving mass participation in its rural organization, 
And then I probably would have said, well, of course there are a few problems, but overall this is the story. I think that in the last couple of years, there has been increasing evidence of a whole series of problems in rural China. We hear constant reports of beggars in China, something which people thought didn't exist. And I think most disturbing for me uh, was that when I recently read the documents from the Central Committee meeting of last December, just about a year ago. And in this document, it's I, I'm not sure that what I'm reading is not a forgery, but I'm assuming it's, uh, it's accurate and, until I get more information. It was reported there that 100 million people had insufficient food in China. The level of insufficiency was not defined. Uh, you know, I, so we're not quite sure what that means. It reported that the annual average income per capita was 60 yuan, which is about $40. Uh, if, you fig if you estimate that food, the cost of food, I believe, is subtracted from that income because people have to eat, grain would probably run 45 yuan per year per capita, leaving a cash surplus of 15 yuan, about $10 per year for miscellaneous purchases like cloth for clothing and flashlight batteries and thermos bottles and you know the things you need when you're living in rural China. Now this uh, figure probably represents collective income and has to be should be increased by some el element for the private income so it's not exactly clear what this figure means but I would say that uh, it's uh, perhaps uh, half or two-thirds what I was estimating average rural income would be. So I would say my own thought is in a state of flux and confusion as we're, I'm trying to figure out where China is. And I'll let you know tonight how far I've been able to figure it out. The first thing that's increasingly clear is the absolute necessity to avoid generalizations in talking about China. Uh, there are very different stories, very different pictures happening in China uh, uh, in different regions. And one of the reasons we put up the map here is to remind you that China is a vast continent with many different regions, many different ecological zones. I think that the areas in which China has been most successful in its agricultural development has been the areas of good water supply, uh, particularly the lower Yangtze Valley, particularly this area down near Shanghai, the Pearl River Delta down here by Canton, this lake area here in Hunan. All, these are all very rich agricultural areas and the development policies of the 1960s, uh, especially the early 60s, were very successful in those regions. In the 1970s, there was a massive improvement in uh, tube well irrigation in the North China Plain. It's this region up here. And that kind of irrigation program, I believe, made major improvements in that region of China. But as I suggested, the, one of the major factors is availability of water. In China, as in elsewhere, plants need water. The regions of China with less rainfall or unstable rainfall have not done well. Uh, one area in which there have been problems is the area of Anhui right in this area. The peculiarity about Anhui is that it's right in the middle. South China gets a lot of rain. North China gets very little. And sometimes that dividing line goes up and sometimes it goes down. So you've got a region that is prone both to flood and to drought. And when it floods, it floods. And when it drought, you know, there's nothing. So this is a region of very unstable climate, and the Chinese have not been able to solve the problems there. 
A second region of great problem is in the northwest area that's very hilly, semi-arid. This area up here. This region was, recent surveys in this region indicate that uh, in some areas the standard of living has declined sharply over the last 30 years. This region seems to, you know, starts out having difficult ecological conditions and these appear to have been aggravated by bad policies. The region was forced to be self-sufficient in grain. That means that the government would not supply grain to the area, so they had to grow their own, even though this area lacked suitable conditions for grain cultivation. Forests and grasses were cut and land plowed. Uh, the er erosion from this area increased and production dropped. Uh, this is a most unfortunate situation. Virtually everybody who visited China in the 1930s said that one of the major problems in China was controlling erosion in that area, trying to replant the trees and the grasses. And it's, uh, I mean, it's no secret, and it's a little bit surprising that erosion has actually increased. But uh, surveys done in the last few years indicate that the total amount of silt carried by the Yellow River as kind of the aggregate measure of erosion in the area has increased uh, substantially over the last 30 years. The Yellow River is uh, this river that cuts through this whole area. It also appears that bad policies have caused uh, fairly serious problems in the province of Sichuan, down in this area. The province of Sichuan has a population of something like 100 million people. If that province were an independent country, it would be the fifth largest country in the world. So when we talk about problems in Sichuan, you know, we're talking about you know, a big chunk of the human experience. For reasons quite beyond my understanding, the, there were policies throughout the 1960s and early 70s to increase population growth rates. Children got full grain rations so that, and, and of course they couldn't eat the full ration, so that if you're a family and you want more food for parents, the simplest way to do it is to have more children. And that policy worked out really well and the population growth rate in Sichuan was very high through the early 70s. Uh, the policy of self-reliance, however, uh, meant that the province of Sichuan did not get additional fertilizer factories after about the mid-1960s. So as population was increasing rapidly, fertilizer was not. The incentives in the rural area were disturbed by a wide range of inappropriate policies that I'll come to later. So the province of Sichuan has been a real trouble spot. In addition to these regional variations, there have been differences from year to year. One problem to which I alluded before was the problem of weather. China's rural society has not been weatherproofed. Uh, production still fluctuates with rain, with drought, with flood and it has a substantial impact on the lives of people. I'd like to emphasize, however, that it's a lot different now from the way it was in the past. If you read some of the, say, missionary reports of what it was like during the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they had floods and droughts in China, it just wrenches your heart out to read. Uh, there was a drought up in this area in, uh, I think it was 1876, and something like 7 to 10 million people died. There, 
and uh, you know, every 20 years or so, there'd be that kind of drought, you know, where as things got better, only three or six million people would die. A drought in those days didn't mean hunger. It meant the destruction of social organization. People would sell first the roof beams from their house, their animals, their land, their wives. Well, usually children were sold before wives. And in some of these droughts, in drought of 1928, the city of Xi'an had an, a, you know, a regular economic market for children. I think it was one Mexican dollar per year of age. That's what drought meant then. Today, drought means uh, food production drops by 20% and people are hungry. That's still a problem, but it's a problem of, very, of a very different order of magnitude. The other, in terms of uh, differences and what happens from place to place, time to time, there were a whole lot of very peculiar problems associated with the succession crisis that China had in 1976 in which central authority was divided and local groups often struggled with each other as they tried to endear themselves to various national factions. The results included serious disruptions in the industrial and transport sector and by 1976 this was important to agriculture because so much of China's agriculture depended on industrial inputs depended on fertilizer, depended on electricity, depended on machinery. And as I'm sure you know here, when those inputs come late, that's almost as useful as if they didn't come at all. So these kinds of disruptions throughout the economy had important repercussions by then. Moreover, in this context of political struggle, local officials sometimes would misreport local production situation uh, so that the government wouldn't realize that there was a grain shortage in an area. They might distribute reserves to get political advantage. All this made it very difficult for the government to organize the, uh, the whole system of uh, distribution of food to the rural areas where there are problems. And then this was even further aggravated by problems of procurement because the central government was weaker in this period of political crisis. So during the following years, grain imports went up substantially. Now to further complicate this whole situation of what's happening in China, I'm increasingly impressed by what I think is the case that each locality, each village has its own history, uh, and its own way of doing things, and one can expect different kinds of rural development experiences in different villages, even if they're right next to each other. There's one bit of evidence of this comes from 1959, when the government recommended communal dining halls. And these lasted for a few months, just a few months, not the years and years that you know everybody thinks that communes meant collective eating and living together. You know, there was a collective emphasis for a few months. When you read Yan Myrdal's book, Report from a Chinese Village, one village, Liu Ling, somewhere around here. And he asked the old party secretary about that time. Did they have collective dining rooms there. And the old party secretary said, yes, we heard some places were doing that, but we knew that wouldn't work in our village, so we never adopted it. One wonders, was, he, was this particular leader a, a man of unusual integrity and strength to refuse to do a dumb thing? Was this rare or was this typical? I'm not sure. It may have been rare, but we don't know. This kind of problem, I think, came up during the 1970s 
particularly in the context of the political succession crisis. Despite public documents, organizational regulations specifying that peasants could maintain private plots in addition to the, you know, the bulk of collective agriculture, in some places, uh, the, collect the private plots were eradicated or were merged together. The Chinese are now reporting that this problem was widespread. I'm confused. I don't know how widespread this was. The documents are clear that private agriculture should be allowed. But is, is it really the case that none of the local leaders had the strength to say, this is what the Constitution says, this is what the 60 articles say, no, we're keeping it this way? I'm not sure, but I suspect that one could find extreme local variation on that kind of a question. And similarly, uh, with regard to the wage policy, the uh, appropriate policies were quite clear that people should be paid according to their work. Uh, there are several different formula, but they all took into account, one way or another, to varying degrees, how much people worked. The Chinese are now reporting that in many areas, egalitarian wage systems were implemented. Again, I think that ultimately how frequently this happens depends a great deal on the character of local leadership. I suspect that the character of local leadership is somehow related to the pre-existing social organization within the villages. You know, there are a lot of different kinds of organizations in villages. In some cases, the village is a single, essentially a single lineage. In other cases, you have people from many different lineages moving into one area. Uh, in other cases, you might have competition between a couple of families. I would think that some of these pre-existing conditions would be conducive to a kind of a strong leadership that could say no to dumb policies, and other kinds of social organizations would be conducive to having a leadership that seeks alliances with factions at higher levels and tries to do what they say they want. Now, I think that leaving aside these problems of year-to-year, region-to-region, village-to-village. There's one other important problem in China's food situation, which is shaping a lot of the literature, a lot of the articles that we read now. And this has to do with the food distribution system in cities. Basically, if you are registered to live in a city, you're given a grain ration book to purchase grain at a particular store. And how much you can buy depends on your family, the number of people, their age, their employment. And as far as I can tell, that system works out pretty well. The problem is that if there are people in the city who don't belong in the city, who are not registered to live there, and who don't have access to these grain stores, these people are in particular problems. And I have a feeling that it's these people illegally in the cities who are, con who are the beggars that show up in the New York Times or in articles in Worldview or other places. Now, why would people be in the city illegally? A lot of reasons. There was a policy to send high school graduates to assign them to live in the countryside. In a lot of cases, they were unhappy and came back to the city illegally. Where do they get their food? It's a problem. Likewise, there are rural people who want to see the city lights, who want to get higher paying jobs in industry, who want the broader social contacts uh, that are available in the urban life. This is happening all around the world, virtually every country, every region, and we shouldn't be surprised to find the same pressures of rural to urban migration in China. In addition, you might have people in the countryside who get into awkward political or personal situations, um, 
A man promises to marry a girl and doesn't, or a girl doesn't like the man she's married, or she doesn't, more likely she doesn't like her mother-in-law, or a whole range of, of political problem, personal problems, or you know, somebody steals something and nobody likes them. You know, people who for one reason or another aren't really fitting into the social system in a small village in which they find themselves might be eager to move to a city. And then, of course, you've got the problem of occasional bad weather, local or regional grain failure and lack of food, and then people moving to the city to get work and food. So you have a whole lot of reasons why people might be in the city without proper papers. And I think this causes a lot of the problems that are showing up. There are so many different kinds of local situations. I think there must be plenty of data for anybody who has any hypothesis on rural development in China. There are plenty of stories to prove that things are fine and there's great success. There are plenty of stories to show that things are in big trouble. And I think that it's going to take a great deal of research to get a comprehensive picture. And it may be impossible and it may be unnecessary. I think what's more important is to realize that the reality is very complicated with different things happening in different places. As I think about my own work, I'm increasingly drawn to the conclusion that I may have underestimated the challenges that China is facing in its rural development. One of the uh, most obvious challenges to which I alluded earlier and I want to speak a little more about now is this whole problem of instability of rainfall, uh, particularly in North China. The problem is fairly simple. The, uh, as I understand that in the summertime, the prevailing winds off the North China kind of like this, parallel to the shore. If the wind is a little more to the west, a lot of moisture comes in and there's a lot of rain. If the wind is slightly to the east, it's drought. And uh, all you have to do is look at rainfall charts to see the tremendous seasonal yearly variation in rainfall up there. And when you read some of the analyses done by um, hydrological engineers during the 1930s, as they tried to think of what could be done in, in this region, they basically said that it's an immense problem. They said that they couldn't think of any other place in the world where so many people lived in such a fragile ecology in terms of you know, the instability of rainfall. You know, this, this area up here that we're talking about has 100 million people. Maybe in the 30s it only had 50 or 70 million people. The problems of handling the rivers through this area are just immense. I mentioned earlier the problem of the Yellow River with its silt. You must realize that, you see, this area up here has a very light, low soil that's blown in from the desert from Central Asia. It erodes very easily. The silt comes down in the river and builds up the river. It, it silts in the riverbed, so people then build dikes. More silt comes in the river, so people build the dikes higher. More silt goes in the bed, they build the dikes higher. Eventually, you get a river that's 30 or 40 feet above the floodplain. This is not unique. This happens to a lot of rivers. But this is an immense problem. And a flood of that situation is very easy and catastrophic. The engineers writing about this problem in the 1930s said this is just an impot They said it was a superhuman task to control this river. Well, I think the Chinese have done remarkably well at it, but we shouldn't be surprised if agriculture in this region remains 
somewhat uh, influenced by the uh, rainfall one way or another. Another major challenge has been the extraordinary demographic growth of China over the last 30 years. Now, I think maybe in a comparative perspective, population growth in China might be a little less than other countries. But it's still enormous. I think that, you know, we, we can think of all the reasons why population growth is less rapid in China than elsewhere. But still, uh, and I'll come back to this later, until recently at least, it really has been profitable for families to have children. They can take care of animals. They can take care of the private garden. They can do a lot of useful things. And as long as it's more profitable to have children than not to, people have children. Another factor I think that I may have underestimated has been the enormous cost of basic economic infrastructure in China. Uh, large regions of the country are very mountainous, very rugged, and some of the, you know, the engineering work to build railroads in these areas make uh, the railroads going through the Rocky Mountains look very simple. It's uh, very expensive to build these things. It takes a lot of investment. Probably it will pay off because it will mean that the different regions of China can be integrated. But this is a very slow process. I think the biggest challenge that China has had, and I want to emphasize now, is the problem of how to deal with China's bureaucratic heritage. You realize, uh, unfortunately, I wasn't here last night when Han Su Yin spoke a little bit about the history. And if she spoke about the history of bureaucracy in China, uh, I'm sure she said it better than I can say tonight. But we must remember that the Chinese invented bureaucracy. 2,000 years ago, during the Han Dynasty. They come, came up with the idea of using education and using formal examinations to test people, to let them into the bureaucracy. For 2,000 years, they've developed a culture of trying to please the superiors, to retain a job, and to keep out of the rural areas, and to keep their fingers clean and their fingernails long. This problem of the historical heritage was very much reinforced, inevitably, by the process of revolution during the 1949, throughout the 50s and 60s. In order to achieve social control over the developmental process, state power was very much strengthened. Rural communities were changed by land reform and collectivization. And you need very strong state power to change the deeply entrenched local forces in, in, a, in any rural area. State power assumed control over the urban-rural relationships when the government established a monopoly over the grain market and over marketing of other important commodities. Uh, both for procuring food from the rural areas and for not having enough relief supplies to help poorer areas. You can't have it both ways. If you expect the government to invest, if you expect the government to have food to supply the cities and to supply areas that have bad weather and grain shortages, the government has to be able to procure. And that requires state power or at least having state power is one of the ways to do it. So these critical aspects of establishing social control over the development process meant that state power was reinforced. Processes of industrialization. Um, I won't go into great detail about industry because I want to emphasize rural development tonight. But I would say that industrialization 
is an integral part, cannot be separated from rural development. To a large extent, China's growth in agricultural production has been predicated on the availability of industrial supplies, whether it's fertilizer or pumps or electricity or petroleum. I'll mention tractors last because I think tractors are the, the, le the lesser important of the industrial inputs that goes into agriculture in China. Industry, though, is absolutely necessary. And similarly, industry has been necessary for national defense. I mean, if we had, uh, I mean, we get very worried about the Russians when they're on the other side of the globe. If we had a 4,000 mile boundary with the Soviet Union instead of with Canada, I suspect we'd uh, be even more concerned about them than we are now. Well, industrial development requires order, requires a structuring of authority. It requires careful management and technological expertise. And all of these problems easily reinforce China's traditions of bureaucracy. To make matters worse, in the early 1950s, China basically copied the pattern of organization which had been adopted in the Soviet Union. At that time, it was thought that the Soviet Union's pattern of organization was synonymous with socialism, really defined socialism. And China just copied the, the textbooks from the Soviet Union, the law books, brought over Soviet advisors. And unfortunately, that whole system from the Soviet Union also reinforced this whole bureaucratic heritage. Mao Zedong and others in China were plagued by this fear of bureaucracy, by some kind of alliance between bureaucracy, urban forces, and an, a, an industrial technological elite. And Mao struggled for a way to prevent that kind of elite from being reestablished in China. Uh, he basically tried an approach of mass participation with an emphasis on ideology and sending people to the countryside or to factories to make sure that the people in authority would have some kind of direct interaction with the workers and peasants. In retrospect, it's clear that the the people who wanted to establish a new elite were able to use this new kind of approach just as well, if not better, than they could use the earlier system. It became harder to uh, control them because there were no objective criteria for judging things. I would say that uh, I'll, I'll mention some of the new policies that are being tried to solve this problem. But I would say that this problem continues to exist. It's not solved yet. Uh, the Peking Review a couple of weeks ago just you know, had a very short article that uh, a pig farm that Chairman Hua Guofeng visited had established, set up a display case with mementos used by Hua Guofeng when he visited this pig farm. I'm not sure what they would have been. You know, a, a, a pointer stick that he might have used to point at a pig, or you know, I don't know what it was, but they made a very elaborate display case. Now, in this case, uh, Chairman Hua suggested they remove it. He thought it uh, smacked a little too much of uh, the cult of the individual, but I think it shows the incessant efforts of people at lower levels of the bureaucracy to curry the favor of the higher levels. Let me mention the new policies which are being used to try to control the bureaucracy in rural areas and to prevent the kinds of managerial blunders that have been made from time to time, place to place. First of all, the policy now gives clear authority to the production team. And I guess you'll have to come to the movie Thursday at noon to find out exactly what the production team is to make its own agricultural plans. 
Uh, the production team is a, essentially a group of 20 or 30, 40 families that own land collectively. They no longer can be ordered what to plant by the uh, commune or county department of agriculture. In theory, the leadership of the commune now is supposed to be elected, and they're supposed to have more candidates than positions to be elected, so there'll be choice. There'll be some competition between people. They haven't quite said it will be a two-party system, but in describing the election system, they've said that this should provide uh, an incentive for people to try to serve their constituencies better. The policy of, uh, of allowing and indeed encouraging small private plots has uh, been reinforced. Let me mention that these private plots amount to something like 5 7 percent of the cultivated land. It's not very much, uh, but this land is planted to high value crops, to vegetables, ginger. Where would China be without? Where would Chinese cooking be without ginger and garlic? Uh, it's a critical element in animal husbandry. A large portion of the pigs in China are owned privately and are nourished by this 5% of the land. So because of the high value crops on it, this 5% of the land can easily produce 30% of farm family income. So it can be very important to the rural economy and also to the urban economy, because it's uh, providing a lot of the vegetables and specialized uh, crops that you know, we, we all like. A fourth general policy in the rural areas is to encourage specialization. One dimension of this is regional specialization. This area in northwest China that I mentioned earlier, this area up here that's uh, so arid and fragile that had been seriously disrupted by overemphasis on grain production, is now being encouraged to specialize in animal husbandry and in forestry products. And other regions will be allowed to specialize in the kinds of commodities for which they have special advantages. Another type of specialization will be by enterprise. Some brigades, brigades are collections of uh, teams, 1,000, 2,000 people make up a brigade. Again, come to the movie Thursday to find out more about it. Some brigades are being encouraged to specialize in some specialty crops, uh, particularly animal husbandry, modern pig farms or chicken farms. Then there is specialization in service enterprises. An experimental seed company was set up to try to provide expertise needed for breeding more specialized types of seeds that will be more productive. One of the most remarkable things in the discussion about setting up the seed company was the suggestion that a commune in County A normally would go to seed company in County A for seeds. But if they were unhappy with the seeds that they got from that company, they should be allowed to go to County B, to another seed company. Essentially implicit in there, in that was the notion of competition between seed companies. They're not private companies. Both companies are state-owned. But the economists in China were encouraging some sort of competition between these enterprises. Now, another type of specialization will be in grain. If some areas are not going to be specializing in grain, if some areas are going to be able to specialize in animal husbandry and forestry products, they have to buy their grain from somewhere. So the state will be setting up about a dozen areas specializing in grain for state procurement to ship that grain to places that will no longer 
try to grow enough grain for themselves. If there is more specialization, there must be more integration. And the, in fact, the integration tasks of the economy are just going up very rapidly, exponentially, I suspect. This would offer a real field day for bureaucrats. And it's also likely that they would mess it up even worse. I mean, in fact, now in the St the planning people talk about the economy and they just put up their hands and they say there's so many more enterprises now than there used to be, it's almost impossible for the bureaucracy to manage it the way they used to be able to do. The emphasis now is that, separate, that each enterprise will have much more freedom in negotiating contracts with other enterprises. A, um, presumably a production team will be able to just, you know, go to a factory and buy pumps rather than writing to the planning commission and say, we'd like pumps. Various units will be able to compete more with each other. In a sense, a market system will develop to integrate the different specialized units. Uh, it's even likely that prices will be set more by market forces and supply and demand than they are now. Now they're really set by pricing departments based on cost of production. And if there's too much supply, things just stand in a warehouse. And if there's too much demand, things are rationed. It's now more likely that supply and demand will affect prices. Another new emphasis is on straight economic incentives rather than bureaucratic orders. Prices are being increased in the rural areas to provide better incentives. And wage systems in the rural areas, as well as urban areas, are being keyed much more to actual uh, production of the worker. Finally, there is a new emphasis on establishing a legal system, codifying laws, setting up a judicial system, and expecting a judicial resolution of disputes. Um, I think when historians talk about China, they usually emphasize that China has emphasized a, a government of man, not government of law. Of course, China does have a tradition of law, but it's probably a weak, it's the weaker tradition compared with the tradition of government by by man, by virtue, by model. And uh, in a sense, this new effort to, to codify the law and to organize things by legal mechanisms probably represents a major watershed in Chinese history. Now, all of these policies that I've mentioned have, to some extent, been tried in the past. Most of them were tried in the mid-1950s, in the early 1960s. They led to some economic growth, and they led to fears of new elites, and possibly new elites also. Um, I'm not sure that, or there's no guarantee that these policies will really be implemented now and won't be discarded. I think China still has the same tension, the same debate, the same need to have strong state power and the same fear of having it. These policies that I mentioned are the new kinds of institutional policies China's following. Let me mention very briefly some of the technical policies which are being followed in the rural areas. Uh, first of all, there is now an immensely strong family planning campaign. The Chinese government in many regions, particularly Sichuan, which I mentioned earlier, that had this you know, really incredible growth, population growth throughout the 60s and early 70s, is now encouraging people to have only one child. And they're making 
special subsidies available to families with only one child, kind of a, family, a child allowance. In a sense, they're reducing the economic loss that happens if you have only one child. And um, this policy may work, although, uh, you know, I'm impressed by how throughout the last decade we've been reading articles about how strong the family planning program is and how effective it is. And, uh, you know, still population has been increasing. So this is one a uh, serious challenge, and they're following very strong policies. I don't, uh, cer certainly there is no official policy for forced sterilization, such as led to Indira Gandhi's defeat a few years ago. But I wouldn't be surprised if things like that happen from place to place, time to time. Um, there are, of course, major policies in terms of improving seeds and general agricultural technology. I mentioned the seed company. I think there will be major improvements in agricultural education and training and agricultural research. One of the major debates in China, uh, as far as I can tell, it hasn't been resolved, is what to do about the water problem for North China. For, I mentioned earlier that in South China there's a lot of rain. The Yangtze River, this one here, has a lot of water. And there have been, from time to time, discussions about channeling water north from the Yangtze River to North China. And sometimes they talk about going here, or here, or here. And as far as I can tell, this question still is up in debate, and they haven't really decided on whether or how to do that. I think at the moment, they are working on kind of, a, of a, the simplest, cheapest solution, which is running water north along the Grand Canal. But whether they'll do anything more than that is a very much open question. Another area of great debate has to do with agricultural mechanization. One problem is, of course, the problem of, of unemployment. But this, I think, is not necessarily the real problem. In a lot of ways, mechanization can increase employment because it permits more multiple cropping. It saves enough time in plowing to get in a second or a third crop, which actually increases total employment. I think the more peculiar problem is that many regions of China follow a practice of intercropping. That is, they'll plant a few rows of corn and then a few rows of beans. Or they might plant, uh, uh, they might plant wheat winter wheat before they harvest the corn and put the wheat in between. Uh, all kinds of different cropping systems like that where they plant one plant before the other one is harvested. And these make a lot of sense in terms of intense use of land. In many cases, they uh, reduce the amount of fertilizer requirements. There's certain ways of controlling pests. But it's almost impossible to mechanize these kinds of fields. You might be able to plow them by tractor, but it's almost impossible to get farm tools in there for cultivating or for harvesting. And to mechanize cultivating or harvesting would require a major change in the whole cropping system. And many people in China think that this cropping system is necessary and it's some kind of distinctive Chinese agriculture which should be retained. So there's, I think, enormous debate now on whether or how mechanization can fit into that cultivation system. For 15 years, they've been trying to design implements that could work in that kind of cropping system, and they haven't been able to. So will they have to give that up? I think 
a, co a corollary issue in mechanization has to do with petroleum. China has large amounts of petroleum, and it has enough for agricultural mechanization. But they have to make a choice about how much petroleum to export to get foreign exchange for industrial investments. It's a very complex balancing question of how to use resources. I think another policy issue, which hasn't been resolved yet, has to do with the question of internal migration. Uh, most regions of the world, you know, there is this uh, tremendous rural to urban migration. China's tried to do it the other way by forcing people to move to the rural areas. I believe that this policy has been substantially uh, reduced. The new program is that high school graduates, of the high school graduates who were assigned, you know, at that time, only about 10% now will be sent to the rural areas. But I think China must be facing the question of opening up a labor market, of allowing people from these these poor areas, fragile, arid areas, allowing those people to migrate more to the cities. In fact, there has been some migration. Uh, some of these areas have lost substantial portions of their population into the urban areas, but that process may accelerate. So for the future, we should not underestimate the institutional, political, and technical challenges in the West, United States, or Europe, the development process took centuries of technical development, capital accumulation, and institutional reform. And we shouldn't expect other countries to be able to do this kind of development you know, much, much, much more rapidly than we did it. If they take a quarter of the time or a third of the time, that's extraordinary but it took us centuries. And let's remember that everything which is done in China in the area of development, as well as I think elsewhere, has inherent risks. It's always easy to be frightened by the risks and to look for shortcuts or to look for easy answers that don't have risks. These, the Chinese have these temptations as we do, and I think it's dangerous everywhere. And then finally, let's really not expect China to come up with miracles They're, that are going to solve all of the technical and social problems of development. It's really an unfair expectation on the Chinese and I think ultimately a reflection of our own naivete. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think China is progressing. It has made a great deal of progress. It will continue to but it's not going to come up with miracles. It's not going to solve all of the problems, and uh, we shouldn't expect it to. Thank you very much.